The following interview was conducted with Edward J. Hensman, Professor Emeritus of Veterinary and Comparative Anatomy for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Thursday, August 6, 2009 at Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Good afternoon, Dr. Hensman. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Let's start off by telling us where and when you were born and your parents and early years, siblings. I was born in 1934 in Wyandotte, Michigan. That's a downriver suburb of Detroit. So we could look south and see Canada, right along the Detroit River. And I think we were fairly poor, but everybody we knew was the same, and so we didn't even know we were poor. Uh, what did your father do? Did he work in? It, it was a factory town, Every, and they were chemical factories, all, almost all based on salt. They had salt. Uh, wells all over by pumping water down to sure. the well and then having the brine come up. So that's what most everybody did. did. Was one of the companies, would that have been Morton Salt? No, or it was Sharples, uh, Pennsylvania Salt Company, Wyandotte Chemical. Well, I can't even remember all There was another one, Di wasn't there a Diamond Shamrock or something like that? There, might there may be. Okay. I think Morton's in Detroit. Oh, okay. There right. must be an awful lot of salt under the ground yes. there. Yes, yes, yeah. right. right. Any uh, brothers and sisters? I have one brother who is 10 years younger and a sister who is 4 years younger. Okay. Tell us about grade school and high school, what the activities and what went on and, and when you are in grade school and high school. Well, other, I remember first grade very well because we had a very special teacher, Miss Grant from Florida. She went home over Christmas and brought us back some orange marmalade in a little jar. I'll never forget that. I don't re remember many of the other teachers until I got probably to high school. Okay, right. And I had some very excellent teachers in what, high school. What, uh, were you in college prep program there? Oh, or? no, I was, I never thought of college until about my junior year. Okay. Uh, any clubs or student? Oh, I was active in everything. Good. You could join. Was it a large school? Uh, we graduated 250 in my class, mm -hmm. so it was fair sized in that time. Right. Okay. Yeah. And uh, one thing that did influence my life was the, what we call the world as a community class. We called it the WAC class, and we had a group of. 12 boys and 12 girls that met every well, couple times a week. And we studied another community. In our in a community in the United States? In the United States. And at the same time, that other community was studying our town. And so then we spent one week going to Duluth, Minnesota. And then the Duluth people came to wind up for one week. And so we studied our city government and our uh, engineering and police work and schools. Fire. Yeah, everything. Sure, everything. Yeah. And then they st we st compared it to theirs. And it was a very good learning experience. Right. Would Wyandotte, uh, their population would have been would have was less than Duluth or not, or was it about the oh, same? Oh, I don't honestly uh, remember okay. about Duluth. I just think it was being a little bit of a larger city, but it's hard to tell in those days. Yeah, I don't remember. Okay. Did, was it, did the school, the high school students, is that, would, would come and visit? Right, okay. yeah. Okay, and, and then you And their teacher and chaperone. Sure, okay. It was that same teacher who lost her husband, and her son was too young to drive, and I had been to Interlochen, a national music camp, with the band at the end of summer in about 1950, I think. And she needed somebody to drive her car up there, and so I wrote and got a job at Interlochen, and so I could spend the whole summer there. And it ended up I went there seven summers in a row. And that's where I really got exposed to college students, because most of them were college students. Right, and they Some came from all, all over, all the, over the country. That's a, right. That's a well-known school that's been oh, going yeah, for right. a long, long time. Right. And anyway, I worked in the kitchen. I wasn't musician, but mixing with all those college students made me think a little bit more about college. Right. Okay. And uh, the other thing that happened in my senior year, I met with a counselor and he said, asked me if I was going to college, and I said, I 
hadn't thought about it. And he said, well, you really ought to go to college. Well, I thought a little bit about it from what people said about Oberlin and Michigan and Michigan State. And so he helped me fill out a form and I got a, Mich a State of Michigan scholarship to go to Michigan State. And I started out in dairy production. And I was very frustrated in dairy production because I was bored in most of the classes. And so I talked to a dorm student counselor and he said, if you really want to be challenged, go into veterinary medicine. And so I switched. And that's how I got started in the veterinary medicine. Okay. Did you switch to the vet school at that time? Could you do that? Was there a pre-vet? It was pre-vet. Okay. We had a two-year pre-vet. Okay. And the other thing that I really liked at Michigan State was they had a basic college. So we did sociology, we did communications, we did humanities, and we did natural science. And everybody took all those courses. And I always, always picked what everybody said was the best professor in every one of those courses, whether it was taught in the early in the morning or late at night. And I got exposed to a lot of things that I never in my life would have gotten exposed to. Right. A good, nice foundation. Oh, well, just at least a, an introduction to right. literature and history and right. studying sociology. Then we had to write essays, and we had to give speeches and, and communications. Yeah. So, How large was the campus in those days? I think it was about 12,000, something like that. Probably comparable to Purdue in those at days. At that time, sure. right. right. Okay. Yeah. And did you live on campus? I did for two years. Mm -hmm. And then I went into farmhouse fraternity for two years, mm -hmm. and then I lived in a co-op for two years. Okay. So then the, the, after the pre-vet, then you went into the got it's a vet, the vet school. school, and that was right. four years? Four years. Okay. And there we got a BS after two years of vet school. Two years pre-vet, two years vet school. So I have a BS degree in 56. I graduated in 58. Okay. With your DVM. DVM. Okay. Yeah. And there was an opening for a job in the mastitis lab that I thought sounded good. So I applied for that, and they accepted me, but they changed the job description. <laughs> How did they change it? Well, they made it an ambulatory position. That means making farm calls. And so what they did is they bought a brand new Ford, whatever year it was, and they put the minimal amount of equipment in it because they wanted to see how well a new graduate would do just starting out. And <clears throat> Until I got my uh, license, which was a couple months while they graded the state board exams, I rode with one of the ambulatory clinicians. And then after that, I had the students that went with me. And that was most difficult. Because as a beginner, you're really not ready to handle, teach students. You're still learning an right. awful lot. You just lot. got out of school yourself. <laughs> yeah. Barely. Another role, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. But I learned a lot. And Did you have to travel very far? Well, we covered just that county. Oh, where, where, uh, around Lansing. Around right? Lansing, right. Okay. Yeah. And I often had to call and get directions because there are a lot of swamp lands there. So you can't get here from there. you got to go around. <laughs> and... No GPS in those days. Oh, no. <laughs> and and the, the farmers, the other thing is I looked too young at that time. And they'd say, who is the stu who is the instructor here? <laughs> That's a couple. That's I, I'm okay. at the same age as many of the senior students. Sure, so. sure. Right. Then what, what came after that? Uh, well, huh? then a friend of mine, Bob Lewis, graduated a year before me from veterinary school. He had come to Purdue. And he said, they're going to open a school here, and why don't you apply? So I applied and came down, had an interview, and was hired. Was the dean at that time, would that have been Hutchins? Was he the dean? Or Erskine Morris? No, it was Hutchins. Okay. I never really got to meet him because one of the, I always remember when I first moved down here, he was in the hospital, and one of the first things I had to do 
is go to visitation and his funeral. Because that, I think it was in the end of July, and I didn't start till July 1st. Yeah. Was the building uh, what's known as the... It was a shell. Still in the South Campus? Was that where it was located? Where, where the vet school was? Lynn Hall was just a shell. Oh, okay. Yeah. They didn't even have office for all of us. My office was in the basement of the ADDL building, the old one. Right, okay. And my office consisted of a desk and a file cabinet and a wastebasket. You yeah. had all the essentials. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we knew that new offices were coming, yeah. Well, tell us about that. You, you got in sort of on the ground floor when the school was just starting. Oh, Did yes. It was exciting, actually. Okay. Because Bob Lewis had never taught anatomy. I had never taught anatomy. In fact, anatomy is the course I disliked the most all the way through veterinary school. And there I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I, I never, well. Were you married at that time? No, I was okay. single, but I got married that September. Okay. Where were you, where were you living uh, when you came? Well, when I first came, I lived in a house on North Grant. With a couple, there was a lady there, she rented out three bedrooms upstairs. Okay. She was a widow, and that was part of her income, I'm sure. sure. sure, yeah. sure. And, but it was very exciting because to start a new school and all these young people coming in. Right. And so. And you, had, and you had to work on the curriculum, and you know, it's well, kind of Well, the getting curriculum was pretty well established. Okay. okay. But what we had to do is just make uh, jury rig everything because we had to teach the first year in the old building. On the third floor of the vet path building. And there were no refrigeration supplies up there to put the cadavers in. We had a, all those large animals on a very small elevator up to the third floor so we could embalm them. <laughs> What about laboratories? You didn't have much in the labs. Oh, no. It was only one lecture room, and part of the courses, I think, actually went over to Lily Hall, because Lily was open. was open then. Okay, okay. That, the facility was a little bit better over there. Oh, well, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and it was exciting working with the first class. All right. And we were really mentored very well without being having the feeling that you were under the thumb of somebody. Dr. Uh, George Christensen was an excellent teacher. Yeah, talk a little about that uh, microscope. That was an electron microscope lab. Right? Well, you, he was our head of department. Okay. And, but he taught the gross anatomy course. And so after, and he gave almost all the lectures the first year. But after every lecture, we, there were just three of us, Bob Lewis, Christensen, and myself. And we kind of critiqued it. And then at the end of each lab, we'd critique the lab. And uh, just take three or four minutes. If somebody yes. gave a lecture, he'd say, the pace was good. You could have said more here. You could have said less here. And That's a good idea. That's nice. Yeah. You're doing mentoring for each other and peer, peer review. Oh, yeah, right. Right, right. Yeah. Right. And then... We moved into the new building, and in, that was... Would that be Lynn Hall? Lynn Hall, okay. right. He had the dedication in 1960. Uh, I think that's right, correct. yes. Okay. And the... Uh, but when we moved in there, stuff had been stored all over campus, equipment. And so some of us, I couldn't drive a big truck, but some people that did, we had the bull gang to move a lot of the stuff, but the little stuff that was stored in this building or that building, okay. They'd send us That's out. still the case today. Nobody knows a lot of things <laughs> no. all around. <laughs> no records. And, but it was nice to move into that brand new building. Oh, sure. Yeah. And we had just, it was TV, <coughs> TV and all the teaching rooms. We didn't use it an awful lot, but that was really up to date. Yeah. In for, the, for 1960. That's oh, right. Yes. All right. And, uh, I bet the students were pleased. Oh, I think so. Sure. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, you're, do you remember the entering class? Were they mostly from Indiana? Almost. The first class, I think, was 50 men all from Indiana. 
I heard there were, it's the second class where there were the two ladies, two one ladies. of which was Carol Ecker. Right. Okay. There were two ladies in the second class. And uh, second class, then we were given more responsibility. We gave more of the lectures. And not a great number, but more of them. All right. I suppose in those days you didn't have assistants at all, TAs or any te at all? Well, in those days. We were it. Okay, all right. Okay, <laughs> What about. When did graduate students start coming? Would that well, have been we later? Had, it was a graduate program here before the school started. It oh, was a fairly strong graduate The veterinary program. science department? Right. Oh, yeah. okay. Because yes. that it morphed from there, morphed into that. That's program. right. All right. Okay. Yes. So you had, and grad students were already in that program? Oh, yes. Sure. Okay. Yeah. And uh, some people actually stayed primarily in the graduate program. Well, I was mostly in the teaching program. Let me ask you a question. In the veterinary science, they didn't. You did not get a DVM from that program. No. Okay. That what was either you? a master's or a PhD. Okay. In veterinary science, would it be? Right. Oh, yes. I see. All right. Good. That yeah. clerk thing for the researchers and like. Right. Want to know that? Yeah. And that department was long had been established years ago. Oh yeah, I don't even know the, when it yeah, started. As part of the uh, College of Agriculture. That's right. All right. Okay. Right. And. Oh, you asked me about when I, I actually got married in September of 1959. Okay. And then we moved into a small apartment. <laughs> uh, I can't think of anything particularly special. Well, about 1961, I think, is when okay. George Christensen asked me if I, I wanted to be in charge that. of the electron microscope. Right, yeah. I'd only seen a picture of one. I had no idea what they were but they were building a room in the basement for it. And so we actually took a trip to Fort Knox, Kentucky, Christensen, Claflin, and myself, because there was a veterinarian that did their electron microscopy on the base. He, wasn't, he was hired by the base, and he had a DVM and was doing their micros microscopy. So we went down there for about a day, and that's the first time I'd ever seen an electron microscope. And so I learned mostly from the uh, from textbooks and from uh, the service people that installed the machine. They had excellent service people in those days, and uh, you can and they can teach you. They could show you. About oh the yeah, how to w make it work, and yeah, sure. right, and so. I, I did that kind of work for my PhD, the ultrastructure of the heart, dog heart. You, you did your PhD here at Purdue when you came, after you came? Oh, yes. I see. Right. Okay. You decided to go on and get that. Yeah. I had a master's at Michigan State in clinics. Okay. And so when I came down here, started working on a PhD, it was very flexible because I, I had a minor in education. Which was unusual. And the From other, uh, Michigan State? No, no, here on campus. Oh, okay. and, a, and a minor in pharmacology, and the rest of it was in anatomy. So, but then I did ultrastructure work for my PhD studies, and I got my PhD in 63. Okay. Yeah. And what department? You were in the veterinary anatomy department? That was veterinary anatomy, right. And uh, I don't remember what year they suggested I first start teaching a graduate course in electron microscopy. The only other electron microscopes at that time were in Lowley Hall, but they used a different brand. We had an RCA and they had a Phillips. They were really quite different. I imagine. Yeah. Electronically, they may have been very similar, but other parts and others. Well, the way you operated them were very different. Sure. Yeah. So anyway, for many years then, I taught a graduate course in the summer. Six graduate students uh, in basic electron microscopy. And taught either gro mostly gross anatomy, but sometimes histology, off and on, and the other semesters, fall and spring. Okay. Talk a little bit about your research. What would you get in? Uh, what was your research area? 
Well, I think you would call it ultra structure, because in those days, it was a brand new science. And people didn't know if, a, for instance, a mitochondrion had two membranes or one. And they didn't know what the Golgi apparatus looked like. They didn't know what cell junctions looked like. Ultrastructural facts that are well known now, but nobody knew at that time. And so it was interesting to just, we had small local meetings. There was a, a meeting that we could go to in Chicago, but that was kind of expensive and time consuming. And so IU Med School and Purdue got together about once every three or four months and we had a meeting on electron microscopy. And here on campus? Or well, it was either here, here or, or at IU. Here. We right. varied it. And it, so my interaction with that technique turned out to be more with like uh, Lily Hall, biology department. Sure. Because they would be using that. That's right. Jim Murray and Charles Bracker, botany and plant pathology, and uh, but it was a fairly small group. Mm -hmm. yeah. And a good learning. Oh yes. Easy to do. That. Yeah, we we talked about techniques and we could see what they're doing in their labs and they'd visit and we'd see what's sure. going on in our labs. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's talk. Uh, you were the when you became the acting head uh, temporarily. Yes. How that came about and what, what See, George transpired. Christensen left in 63. Okay. He went to become dean at the Iowa State Veterinary School. And so Mel Stromberg took over and he went on sabbatical to Sweden for a year. And so I was acting head. This is 71, 72? Either that or 70, 70, 70 71. 70, 71. Right, right, okay. Yeah. And that was a learning experience. <laughs> I bet, I bet. Any but, comments? <laughs> well, I knew a long time ago, I, did, I wasn't interested in administration. People can't understand that, but that doesn't turn me on. I enjoy working with the students. You're a hands-on person. Well, one-on-one yeah, -on -one or sure, even right. lecturing, and I don't necessarily enjoy lecturing either, but... Uh, you like the interaction. Oh, yes. That's great, yeah. 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 But anyway, it was during that year, I remember that the IU Med School was thinking of having a statewide plan where they would have some med students here. Our department head was in Sweden and... Oh, Dr. Stromberg. Dr. Stromberg. And so the secretaries set up a call for me to call Sweden. They checked the times and all that. I'd never made that kind of call. Uh, find out whether we wanted to do that, to teach anatomy to the first year med students. We could have turned it down probably. And he said, yes, go ahead. So we did. And it's really flourished in association with the med school, right. I think. Well, and you continued with you teaching them? Is it? No, oh. I didn't work in that program until 76 then. Okay. And then you didn't go back and teaching the uh, at the med center, which is here, the IU school. You only taught here, the cam on campus until '76, or you? No, I started that in '76. Uh, I see. We right. actually hired some new faculty members that didn't work out very well, and so. Uh, I forgot. Had forgotten what year it started, but I knew it was around '75 or something like that. Well, the school actually started about '72 or so. Oh, okay. But that I got involved in 76. Okay, okay. Somebody left and Mel Stromberg was kind of low-key as the department head and he'd say, you know, we're kind of short in this course this fall. Could you help out? Or somebody's going to be gone. Could you take over their course? And so I actually taught in 14 courses and I professor of record in eight of them. So, <laughs> very I, I have a very non-focused career. But very meaningful. Well, it is to me, but, that's right. and I really, as I say, people don't understand why you don't want to be a department head or a dean. It doesn't appeal to me in the least. I can do other things. 
Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And then you also, in 81, 82, how did you were the acting head at that time, too? Well, that's when uh, Stromberg stepped down and there was a search going on for a department head. And the search resulted in Dave Van Sickle being made head of the department. Okay, okay. Uh, promotion and tenure was is a little bit different in those days than it is now. It was quick. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot easier. Oh, apparently so. Yeah. 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 I mean, you had to satisfy certain criteria, I guess, but no, it's very difficult now. Yes. Yeah, because you can see I was a full professor by 1970. Right. That's right. I, yeah. yeah. Um, how about the impact of technology on the curriculum within the school? That's made a big impact, has it not? Technology such as your, the videos and other things that you've got oh, going yes. in, the, in the labs, the computers in the labs. Yes, yeah, but there are certain things that the computers can't replace, I don't think. Right. There has to be some hands-on. you got to feel what a bone looks like, sure. what it is, turn it around, and it's just not the same on the computer. Sure. You can do a lot of things. I think it's very good for remembering things. Uh, it aids in recall. You can remember what you've seen. And maybe I'm old, but my eyes don't stand up to the computer that long. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you're saying. How about um, committees, any uh, school or departmental committees that you served on? Oh, well, I've been a lot of them, but I... Sure. Probably the one I was on the most was curriculum committee. That's right, according to Vita, that's right. Yeah. And so... And that's one of the most, a very challenging committee to be Right. On. Yeah. And it's hard to s satisfy everybody. Yeah. To come to consensus <laughs> of some sort. And then during that time also, the school changed its name in 74 from right. veterinary science and medicine to vet school of veterinary medicine, which it is today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what about diversity? Uh, women, you got more women in the school over oh, time? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, it's still difficult to get some of the minorities. And they try to recruit, but veterinary medicine just uh, apparently doesn't appeal to them as a career. As a career, yeah. yeah I mean, it does to a few, but not very many. Yeah, you have to continue working yeah. on it. Um, advancement and the funding to, uh, funding the school that increased over time. Oh and yes. Not especially, well, the, the charge come from came from the university. They had people heading that up, and then the mm -hmm. schools right. had people there too. Right. And you get to know your alumni and things of that sort. Right. You know, which is really kind of nice. Um, you're st are you, uh, did you the course that you taught for the Iowa School of Medicine was the neuroanatomy. Neuroanatomy, right. right. When that full school first started was just pres first year students, but now they have the first two years. That's right, and very soon, I think it's 2010 or 11, they'll have some juniors and seniors here. So they're going to make they're, it four year here? Yeah, no, I think they'll probably rotate some back to, to the main campus, to, to uh, Indianapolis, but they're going to have places where they can work in the new hospitals. Oh, okay. The hospitals are gearing up to have them. Okay. Be more active there. Was um, the Purdue campus one of the earlier ones that uh, for the the IU School of Medicine, or not? Or were there some that were before that? Well, actually, the IU School of Medicine at one time was at Bloomington, and then it moved to Indianapolis. And so Bloomington, I guess you'd have to say, is probably would be considered that one, right because it's still a one of the one brands. of the satellite yeah. campuses. I can't remember when. Some of the others started, but being on that faculty, we had department meetings with the Department of Anatomy from all over the state. We usually had one in the fall at one of the uh, state parks. And then we had visitations. We visited uh, North Central, we visited Evansville and Terre Haute, just to see what they were doing. So, and I served on committees at, at Indianapolis, IU committees. Uh, I didn't like that because they'd have a four o'clock meeting. But that meant you had to leave here at least by two, and you didn't get home till probably six thirty or seven. <laughs> but 
for a one hour reading. <laughs> Most of it's on the road, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh dear. Uh, let's talk a little bit, can you mention something about family? Do you have any children? I have three. Okay, did, any of them, did they come to Purdue? They all graduated at, from Purdue. Okay, and what, we from had, what schools? As, uh, any of them in vet school? Oh no, oh. no. They didn't even like the things I did very well. But uh, it's dad's thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> One in communications, and two in uh, I guess you call it planning or something. Uh, in the management school, or no, uh, somehow through ag school, and I'm not sure. Okay, okay. Yeah, but they coded so much that it was hard to get. What they finally zeroed right. in on <laughs> they put their final focus, right? right. Yeah, and where, do they any of them live in Indiana? Two of them do, both okay. in Speedway. Okay. My son works at the IUPUI library. And my daughter works in the courthouse downstairs, down at downtown at the uh, federal courthouse. Okay. Uh, she's in the probation office, but she's human resources, so she doesn't have to go out and visit people. And I have a son in. Springfield, Illinois, works for the state. Okay. He does computer type stuff. I'm not land use or something. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, let's move on a little bit to. And you were the uh, one of the other things. You were the chairman of the graduate committee at one time in the school for for the department. Were you not? Oh, oh well, yeah. I was kind of the contact person. I accepted the applications, made sure everybody saw them and then had a committee meeting to see whether we would accept that person. And so then I had the obligation to tell the ones that we didn't accept, and, but the fun part of telling the ones we did accept, so. How did the uh, applications, did they become more with, throughout the United States as well as Indiana app applying? You know, it's funny, depending on, on how much publications, or not publicity, I guess you want to say. People have to think of a school before they apply there, and so there has to be enough publicity and maybe some publications uh, or something to want them to come there. Okay, okay. And, and anatomy just doesn't attract very many. Mm -hmm. Really doesn't. Okay. What sort of jobs did some um, some of the graduates that were in anatomy what would they could go into practice or government? No, I think. <coughs> excuse me. I think almost every one of them has gone into teaching in some form. Okay. Okay. Alrighty. Um, there were, you mentioned earlier there were a number of other committees. You're on the Silver Anniversary Committee and academic standards, so yeah. you, you had a lot of committee work there. Oh yeah, I was on a lot, of, it seemed like it. <laughs> <laughs> when you see that list there, that's right. Uh, let's talk some about your awards and honors. One of the ones that, uh, is that Indiana University School of Medicine, the mm -hmm. Outstanding Bake. You received it for a number of years, yeah. which is really nice. That one is kind of nice to receive because it's actually voted on by the seniors at, just before they graduate. Okay. So they they're three years away from my course. And if they still remember me, that's good. That's a nice yeah. compliment. Yeah, yeah. And so then that's, that one I kind of like. Right. Yeah. Um, you got and the Amico Award for the at Purdue Outstanding Undergraduate mm -hmm. Teaching, and you're in the Purdue Book of Great Teachers, mm -hmm. which is nice. That That's on a, in the union there. And then the uh, Distinguished Teaching Award from the Norton Laboratories. That's just one of the awards that comes to the vet school. Oh, okay. Is Norton, is that, a, is, that a, is that a company? Yeah, it is a pharmaceutical company. All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you got that several times. And then the uh, Veterinary Medicine Alumni Faculty Award for Excellence, you got mm -hmm. that a couple of times. So that's, that's kind of nice. And teaching is your forte. This is what you like to do, and you certainly have been recognized for well, these yeah. awards. Well, I, I enjoy the students. All right, yeah. okay. Um, Professional associations, you were the uh, president in 82 83 of the American Association of Veterinary uh, Atomists. Atomists, right. Atomist, right, yeah. yeah. Do you still uh, participate in any no, of the associations? Don't. You don't go to any of the meetings or no, anything? No. If I get their newsletter, though. Sometimes, maybe. Uh, I just some haven't of really thought much about doing right. that. <laughs> uh, and the American Association of Advancement of Science. 
and of course the American Medical Medical Association. Mm -hmm. Do you right. still, every fall, they have an annual meeting here at Purdue for the researchers. Do you still try to go to those meetings? Like sometimes. The Indiana one. Uh -huh. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, that's been a long, long going annual meeting and they have it in mm -hmm. the fall. Right. Which is, has it normally always been held at Purdue? Yeah, many years ago, before the school started, they oh, called okay. it the fall conference. Okay. And the veterinarians came in and they just had a kind of a short course. Here on, cam here on, on campus. campus. Oh, right. right. Okay. And then when the school started, uh, it got a little bigger. And then as we started to have graduates from here, it's grown and grown and grown. Sure, yeah, a big alumni yes. group <laughs> right. now. Right. Yeah. Um, the deans, let's see, now, when you came after Hutchins, then that would have been Erskine Morse. Erskine Morse. And then Jack Stockton, would he mm -hmm. come next? And then would that have been Hugh Lewis? That Hugh came Lewis. In? And then Alan Rebar. Rebar. I never worked with Al Rebar. Okay. He had gone by the time he was put in I retired before. Retired, okay. Yeah. And then, of course, the current one is Willie Reed. Right. Who had... Did you remember him when he was here? At, um, oh yeah, he told me I had him in my electron microscopy course. I didn't remember that. Sure. But <laughs> they remember because you're one on, and you know that's a class. So that's okay. Um, tell us a little about now about some of the activities you're involved in in retirement. What you've okay, been doing. I'd be happy to do that after I say that deans differ. Oh. A and I I enjoyed working with the deans that would accept suggestions. They get to make the decision yet, but some deans don't like to accept any suggestions. <laughs> their ma their mind is made up, and I enjoyed more working with the ones that would at least listen to a discussion. Know that there's some feedback, you know, right. that they welcome it, and yeah. you get you feel better about it because oh, you, yeah. you learn from each other. Oh sure, but but they really differ. Oh, yes. Yeah. Each personality. That's, That's right. right. <laughs> yeah. And then we'll see when you came as the president would have been Dr. Hubdy. Oh, Hubdy, right. And then Dr. Hansen mm -hmm. and Dr. Baring, and then in between that, Dr. Hicks. And then uh, after Dr. Baring, of course, was Dr. Chesky. Mm -hmm. But Dr. Baring was still here when he was the president when you were still. Oh, yeah. Governor. See, Baring at one time was in charge of the statewide medical program. Right. I and then he that. became dean of the medical school. Mm -hmm. So when an IU program first started here, Baring used to come up and Lindy Wagner, who was the director of the program, would have a picnic in the fall for the students and the faculty. And Dr. He, Baring would come? Dr. Baring would come, oh, right. So yeah. you got to meet him beforehand, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> not on a very personal basis. My. I think I get to know more of the people that clean the hallways and the secretaries, but uh, I, I just don't get to know the... Oftentimes you do, you don't, you, in passing or some oh, event yeah. or something like yeah. that, and they yeah. recognize you, you know, right. kind of thing. Or when you come back for an, uh, somebody who's retiring and then they're there, which That's is right. really kind of nice. Yeah. yeah. Well, go ahead, talk a little about what you're doing and been doing in retirement. Okay, well, I'm a member of Lafayette Kiwanis Club. So I do some of their volunteer work. What does, uh, anything specific you'd like to mention? What well, sort of things do they we are take tickets in? at the football games. Oh, at you the do? student date, gate. Okay. And we work Then can the you go to the game afterwards? Well, very little of the game is left. <laughs> they don't get there before this game starts. <laughs> well, we, we have to get there, I think it's an hour and a half before the game starts because the gates open an hour before the game starts. So, you know, we work the student gates, so you have to make sure everyone has their student ID, and uh, some of them aren't very good at falsifying their IDs. <laughs> <laughs> Not creative. <laughs> no. <laughs> but, you know, it's you're really very busy for that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. And then work the bas some of the basketball games. What, men and women? Or? Well, one year I worked both men and women, but my back wouldn't stand up for that. That's a lot. There's a lot of games. Oh, well, yes. And then if you're an usher, you stand for three hours. And two hours is okay, but the third hour, I could barely walk to my car. So I, I worked the men's games last year and the football games. And then we do other things around campus. Uh, set up things for the walk for babies, set up all the equipment. 
And Do you belong to the Purdue Retirees Association? I used to. I was okay. on a committee there of the trips and tours for, okay. for six right. years. Sure. Yeah, but I don't go very much. Okay. I try not to schedule too much. No, you can get very busy. You can. <laughs> yeah. And then through Kiwanis, they have a program where they the volunteers go to Klondike Elementary School. And in two years, I've worked with seven different teachers. And that's all the way from kindergarten, first grade, fourth and fifth grade advanced students, and... What sort of things do you help the teacher with? That's interesting. It really depends on the teacher. Okay. Uh, with the do kindergarten... You know, uh, one once a week, or how does that I, work? When I'm working at Purdue in the fall, I only go once a week. As soon as that's done, I'll go twice a week. Okay. But with the kindergarten class, the first year I started, I couldn't believe it. Those kindergarten kids read so well. So I talked to the teacher, and she said, I'm giving you my best readers so they can really go ahead. And she's working with the ones that need help. The solo ones, yeah. Right. And, uh, and so one-on-one, -on -one, a lot of it is. They have little tables in the hallway, and the students come out and read a book. Uh, do sight reading words, make up tests. Do uh, you stay all day? Oh, no, no, just half a day. Okay. An hour and a half is, I'm tired. <laughs> they, they can take you away. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but it's fun. Yeah. And, and I enjoy hearing the students. The teachers laugh. Because I said, I wanted to hear some students laughing. They said, you can hear all 900 of them here. <laughs> Yeah. And now you are, you mentioned earlier you're doing a volunteer at vet school? Yeah, I oh. go back last year and this year I'll do it again. I just work in the laboratory of the neuroanatomy portion. Okay. So. Do you do it in the, what, the fall semester? Or fall semester. Just the fall semester. Yeah, they start off the semester with that course. A little difficult because the first day we're supposed to learn 50 words, but there are probably another 25 that they have to know to be able to understand the 50, and so they get overwhelmed. And so it's good to have a little more help there. Sure, right. uh, if they were second year students, they would probably handle that fine, right. or maybe even later in the first year. But the first few days, they don't know where anything is. They need a little extra help. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you, have you done any traveling, or do you, uh, what about hobbies? You got any special hobbies that you're interested in? I don't have any particular hobbies, I guess. Do you, uh, they have a lot of activities. He lives at a uh, university place, they have a lot of activities. Oh yes, there. we have a lot of speakers there in the evenings. Sure. And uh, I try to walk about 10,000 steps a day, use a pedometer. And I, if I don't make it, I'll make it up the next day. You can match it up. Right. right. But. I try not to schedule too many things. I'm kind of an introvert, so I need some quiet time. That's right. Yeah. Ever try to keep it in balance? Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. How about a, a Purdue tradition? Do you have one that you'd like to share with us that comes to mind? I can't think of one. Uh, what about an outstanding event? Doesn't have anything that, that sort of uh, you'd like to recall? You recall something that came about? I think you've stumped me with both of those. Okay. I can't think of Sometimes anything. Sometimes getting a degree or meeting my wife or getting married or something of that sort. Well, see, I, I had planned to get married before I even came, came down here. It's just that my sister was getting married in June, and so they couldn't handle two weddings in the, within that one month period, so ours was in September. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll leave it up to you. Some closing remarks or an overall whatever you'd like to share with the researchers that you'd like to in closing as you look back and look ahead? Well, I've enjoyed all my time here. I mean, there are bad days and good days, but I've, en I've enjoyed right. Purdue. And you also decided to, re to continue in main, main and live in Lafayette? Even oh, yes, retired. yes. Uh -huh. yeah. It's a nice community, I think. Right. I, I, t I tell people it's a nice place to raise a family. I think it is. And... Never been associated with the West Lafayette schools, but the typical new schools, I think, do a good job. Mm -hmm. They've got a more difficult job, but that's why I like 
just helping out. Just a little bit there. Sure, right, yeah. okay. Yeah. Any Anything else that uh, you think can think of, or I think we covered pretty much everything? I think so. Okay. I can't think of anything else. All right, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Hinsman. I You're appreciate welcome. that. My pleasure.